Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Matt Carlson of Rib Splitter Knife Works. I first discovered Matt's work on Instagram a few years back when I was ravenous for Pical style fixed blades and seeking out everything in the format that I could find. The rib splitter scythe and the Draug Pical models really caught my eye. Eventually, I was lucky enough to land a Draug, uh, but the refined road warrior vibe of the knives and the increasingly exotic profiles and blade shapes convinced me that when it comes to knife making, Matt is no one trick pony. We'll meet Matt and talk about his brand of self defense fixies. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you'd like to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is to head on over to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon and check out what we're all about over there. Again, it's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Matt, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. What an intro for such a uh, simpleton like me. Like I told you before we started uh, filming, you've got 100 established awesome knife makers that you've interviewed and uh, one pro Magnon, which will be me. So uh, I'm very honored to be on your show. Um, I definitely feel like I'm sitting in great company being on this. So thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. Oh, the pleasure's mine. The honor's mine. Um, yeah, so I'm I'm holding a knife of yours in my in my hands right now, and as I said, uh, this really came along at the right time. Uh, I was uh, I I have a background in Filipino kali, and I I I love all forms of knife fighting, and I came across libre fighting and the the beauty of the pakal style, and that's when I uh, found your stuff. And um, you were already there, and you you already had a, a real um, developed style at that point and a number of different models um how did you get into pakal style knives we'll find out about how you got into knives and how you make them but first i'm interested sure. in that um you know it it always made sense to me the the earliest time i can think of that i was thinking about pakal style knives was actually just thinking about animal claws i was like well you know you look at the claw of a tiger how does it shake how does it work right it's a it's a piercing and a dragging effect um, and I was like, well, that makes sense, uh, you know, as a knife. Um, it always felt more natural to hold something in simple uh, speak in uh, Libre vernacular. So uh, in a scythe grip, you know, with the thumb cap point down edge in, um, that always just seemed um, the most familiar to me from like a self-defense standpoint. So that was really it. Um, I remember seeing movies and pictures of stuff and you know they'll have the knife and i'll grab a knife i'll grab a knife so i can show you but you know they would have the knife and they would have it uh point down thumb cap and then they would have the blade out and i was like but wait what if and it's like i'm not the first person that thought of this obviously but i was like why don't you turn the edge in that way when you you know you go out and you pierce and you pull back your cutting. It just seemed, you know, self-explanatory to me. Um, and so that kind of fostered my um, hunt for an affordable fixed blade. So I didn't start carrying a fixed blade knife um, besides like a Mora. You know, everybody has a Mora or five Moras. <laughs> Excuse me. And, uh, you know, I always had a companion with me. And my first fixed blade that i bought was actually from a guy in pennsylvania and he's no longer in business a real small guy um so i received the i received the knife in the mail and i look at it and it's awesome you know i'm stoked you know whenever you get whenever you get a knife in the mail it's a good day um and i looked at it, i was like you know what i could make that and you know i i spent whatever for it it wasn't an expensive night uh, it was jute wrapped, so you know, no hard hands or anything. But I looked at it, and I was like, you know, 
it's something I'd like to try. So I made a sax for my dad's birthday like three or four years ago, and it looked like a hammered dog crap, right? Uh, it was it was rough in every sense of the word. Um, but man, I was bitten. I was bitten, and I knew. And then I started finding out about uh, like Ed Calderon and people like that. Uh, Craig with Shiv Works, seeing their stuff, um, and just being really inspired you know inspired and was really stoked to find a community out there that was into these knives in the way that i was into them too i was never really into the bucks or the uh like the cold steels or stuff like that the, when i say cold steels i'm like a general pocket knife kind of mm -hmm. you know there's some cool cold steels. don't get me wrong there's some totally awesome cold steels um but i don't know i was always just into different knives fantasy knives Grew up reading Tolkien, watching all the fruity B movies, you know, uh, reading a lot of Conan. And uh, so yeah. I tried to take all that and squish it together and make a knife out of it. And that's kind of the, the, the very beginnings of Rib Splitter Knife Works. Yeah, I noticed the Conan theme in, in both your T-shirt that you sell on your website uh, I think it says something like Sumerian steel or something. <laughs> and then your uh, oh, there, yeah. line, this you can trust. Yes, I've that's right. I, a, a few people have, a few people have caught the reference. Um, yeah. So that's one thing. I'm kind of like a, a knife art hoarder. Um, if I could have a hundred different t-shirts and a hundred different stickers with a hundred different designs and have them in holograph and eggshell. And I mean, it's, I'm a big sticker guy, so I I try not to go around to all these awesome artists and be like, I need a design from you, and I need a design from you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I got these shirts. So I'm wearing one of the shirts. I thought it would be fitting. It's actually the only one I have left um, in large. And um, there's a guy on Instagram, Sawblade666. I don't remember his first name. Forgive me. Awesome artist, um, and I'm very thankful to have uh, some of his art on the back of his shirt. And so I ordered some shirts, right? And I was like, dude, these are going to fly off the shelf. Like, they're not going to be able to stay in stock. They're going to be gone in 30 seconds. And I still have some to this day. And I, you know what I mean? So it's one of those things. It's like, well, maybe not everybody thinks Conan's as cool as I do, but uh, yeah. that's okay. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. There, there, there are many of us. We, we are lead. There, there are plenty of us out there who who love Conan, um, especially there are. Uh, the the riddle of steel, and then and then just you know even though the way the the whole sword is made in the beginning is you know pretty bogus with the pouring the steel and it's still oh, yeah. thrilling and he quenches it in the snow you know and yeah and yeah the, yeah the, the riddle of steel. Uh, so you're you're talking about the kind of knives you're drawn to and not necessarily your average EDC pocket pocket knife but uh fixed blades uh no doubt for their utility you were talking about mora but then as you discovered uh more of the more of the uh universal style i mean I, I, don't get me wrong ed calderon thinks that moras are some of the best fighting knives out there but um, still got a ton of them love them you you evolved into making this kind of thing and these sort of exotic shapes and now you're mm -hmm. doing um you know, you've gone, you've gone beyond this, uh, but tell me, uh, before we go beyond the Pakal, uh, tell, tell me about the different, uh, models, uh, you've made and, and what they mean. First of all, what does drog mean? Okay. I'm very glad you asked this. So a lot of people have thought that I has, I have misspelled Draugr, which is actually not the case and no fault of their own. Um, drog was kind of an Easter egg that I threw out there and nobody has actually ever asked me what it meant, which is fine. Um, to be honest with you, Bobby, as a quick aside, the hardest thing about making knives is coming up with a name for the knife, taking pictures of the knife. Those things stress me out to no end. When I come out with a, a design, I'm like, God, what do I got? What, what's left? What's left out there that I can call it? I mean, it, I, I honestly debated just being like, this is number one two, three, four, et cetera, and never giving any of them names because it stressed me out because I'd chew over a hundred different names and, the, you know, they're all kind of, uh, how many demons and drugs and wraiths and, and vipers and, you know, stuff 
is out there and they're all cool names don't get me wrong um but i digress that's that's my own uh tism showing there um back to your original question what was your original question again what does drog mean ah yes okay yes <laughs> so drog is cinderin for wolf so cinderin is a uh tolkien invented language and uh -oh. one day i was sitting in my little room with all my books and i was like okay i got this cool knife here now i got to name it and i'm like i don't know so i grabbed my uh my middle earth companion and i'm looking through the words so it shows all the words real and imaginary that tolkien used in all his uh writings and stuff and i'm looking and I'm like, oh, there's names for rivers and mountains and trees god there's a lot of trees in here and i'm looking and i just happened to uh be going through the d's and i saw drog and it was Cinderin for Wolf. And I was like, that's cool. And I said, I've never heard, I've heard Draugr, but I've never heard Draugr before. So I said, that's it. Uh, I looked it up uh, when I first got the knife. And I remember reading something like, the closest thing I found was Russian for zombie or something yeah, like that. Yeah, and, like, and that's where everybody gets Draugr. You know, anybody that plays Skyrim, the oh, Draugrs okay. are the undead oh, in nice. Skyrim. So uh, okay. I'm a big Skyrim fan too. So I totally, like I said, I totally get it. Um, but I was hoping one day somebody would be like, Hey, is that Tolkien? And I'd be like, yeah, you get a kudos for me, but that's okay. Uh, so now you've popped the secret. Well, that's awesome. Right here uh -huh. on our show. You that's right. That's have, a first. You have one called the scythe, right? Mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. think that's the first one I saw. And I want to, I want to ask you about the shape. Uh, okay. So here, mm -hmm. here, the drug, uh, has the, um, has the, you know, tip down edge in typical Pakal setup. And it's got the mm -hmm. the uh, blade aligned with the knuckles and the tip reaching out just a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. With the scythe, the tip reaches out at a at a more drastic. It's angle. higher. Yeah, yeah it's tell, higher. Tell me about that. The uh, the purpose of that. So I'll give you. Let me see. I've got actually. Oh, no, I've got my box here. I don't have any scythes, but I actually do have a drug that for anybody that's looking. Uh, this thing has been on the internet for like a mm, long time. Wish somebody would buy it. Super cool. Um, so to get to the point geometry, I'll start off with saying um, a little bit of history, if I may. The first side. So my dad helps. Um, he's got the 220 outlet, so he has the plasma cutter. And he gets to use it for whatever he wants, uh, except for when I'm cutting out knives. So um anyway one day he cuts out this knife and he's like hey what do you think about this what do you think about this shape and i look at it and it looks like a like a leaf on a stem or something and i'm like oh that's it's something it's not nothing you know i didn't want to hurt his feelings um but i looked at it and i said you know what though if i just take it so it just uh okay for reference so it was it was flat across the handle and then just imagine that this belly's filled in so it was pretty much just straight across there so like your typical uh uh i don't know basic edc belly knife i was like well if i take this flat knife and i set this on the rear wheel of my belt sander i was like well I could turn that into a reverse edge knife. So I took it and held it on the grinder for a few seconds and gave it um, the, the sweep of a reverse edge knife. And I looked at it and I was like, you know what? I think we got something here. So I took it back, back to dad. He was mad. He was like, why are you ground up my blank? And I was like, oh, it's not, don't worry. We're not out any great loss here of the, <laughs> the loss of that blank. And uh, so that was the original first scythe and um that really gained traction and i'm just so thankful um if there's one theme that i can carry through here or if, if there's a clip note that somebody can take home it's uh gratitude um for you bob for having me on the on the podcast and for everybody i'm just so thankful that i even get a, a, an opportunity to make knives so many people um start out making knives there's so many knife companies out there and guys that are working hard, trying their best, and they just don't make it. And thank God, um, it's 
been able to keep going and people have enjoyed what I've made um, and continue to, to support the company. And I um, 100% I am just full of gratitude for every single person um, that's ever just gave an encouraging word, of course, spotted knife. Um, so I always hold on to that gratitude from day one. So there's that, but onto the sites. So I made the scythe and like, this was a drug. So like you say, in regards to the point, pretty much in line with the knuckles. Um, so when you reach out, if you were to reach out, the further you have to reach out to penetrate something, um, you know, if you grab your, any one of your calls, the further you reach out, that point starts going down. Right. So that was basically the only thought behind it was how do I keep the point up without having to flex my wrist mm. the further I go out? Um, so the Gen 2 scythe addressed that issue um, with flexing that point up. My hope was to have a further reach, the further I keep getting that reverse, the further I go out, instead of it starting to curve down, right. that point will stay up for just a little bit longer. Uh, and it looks kind of cool too, but that's my personal opinion. I I I also, in my personal opinion, think it looks really cool. That weird because it's so an arresting. Too. It's visually arresting, and then you and then when you realize what it's all about, it's all about business. But but when you it hold is. it in your hand, if you if you do any shadow boxing with it and you jab with it, uh, mm -hmm. with with that point, you you don't have to torque your wrist in a weird way. It just lands. No, uh, you know, right right where it's going. Um, I, I don't natural. know about the scythe itself, but but I have a, a few pick calls that have that sort of angle. Uh, yeah, or, if or you have more, one, you, you understand the experience. Yeah, yeah, but the the look of yours is is something else, and something. All right, I want to talk about how you make the blades, and then I also want to talk about the handles separately because they're both sure. very um, refined in your style. Uh, and and thank um, you. Yeah, you're you're welcome. Let's talk about the blades first. How do you how do you make these? So, um, in regards to the metal I use, everything is 100% in house. So I have to be able to heat treat it myself. So I stick to the high carbon steels, 295, 1084, 15 and 20, you know, uh, 5160. Um, the first, probably the first. 100, 150 knives were all cut out with a Harbor Freight uh, angle grinder, mm -hmm. one at a time. Um, made a lot of knives out of saw blades, and I still do. Um, some people, some people get caught up in or like to delve further into the metallurgy, and they're just like, "Well, if it's not 52-100, or if it's not Nitro V, or if it's not this out of the other, why even bother with it?" Right? Well. Uh, back to Ed, I saw a video when I was just started making knives and I saw a video that he posted just as an example to people. Uh, two guys are sitting in an airport arguing. This one dude pulls out the biggest flathead screwdriver I've ever seen in my life and turns around and chunks it into this dude's sternum. Mm. And I'm talking like one of them big pry bar flatheads, you know, that you only use for like prying stuff. Um, so then I was like, hmm, if they can do that with a flathead screwdriver, does it really matter if you know, I have a needle point or maybe a little bit wider point, or if it's, if somebody, God forbid, Bobby, God forbid you ever have to stick something like this into somebody uh, because you're, you are, your loved one's in mortal danger. Are they going to be like, oh, ha ha, 1084, not effective against me. I rebuke, I rebuke that attack. No, they're not going to. So um, I find that as long as I can heat treat it and it passes my tests for hardness, we're good to go. We're game on. So, yeah, I did a lot of angle grinder cutting. Started out with a Harbor Freight 1x30 uh, belt sander, which is slow and terrible. And I remember I still have some of my first uh, 24 grit 1x30 belts. I was like, whoa, whoa. I mean, I paid like $5 a piece for them. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to recover from this. Like, I, I spent... $50 on belts and it was, that was a big deal. So, um, I like to keep those memories close cause it's, um, make a nice the type business, but, um, yeah, it's, it's all done in house. I've got, um, a majestic three burner forge out there now. Um, I ran with, 
um, a single burner eBay, Amazon special propane forge for my first. Well, up until about maybe six months ago, I finally decided to splurge and buy this uh, majestic forge, which is just so nice, um, especially because, I mean, like you said, like the Chris, which I have here, which I, I think you need, Bobby, but that's just beside me. Um, <laughs> I think you, you know just right. a subtle <laughs> nod there. Oh, this light makes me look so red. I'm not this red in person, I promise. But um, man, the three burner makes it so much easier for heat treating bigger blades. Um, I had to do the whole like in and out, in and out, in and out, oh, no yeah. pun intended. Uh, trying to get the heat evenly displaced on those blades, so that was a big thing. But um, so that's the metal. Well, uh, but before you move on from the metal, I want to. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put the the uh, my drag up as close as i can here Hopefully yes focuses. uh that texture you see that a lot i have surface. some texture too yeah, yeah. What, what is that is that heat treat scale or tell tell me about that i, so, I love the look i'm sorry uh to interrupt you but in no. the beginning i i said road warrior aesthetic and that's kind of what i was thinking i love it i mean be, because they are like very like um in profile and in treatment and the way they feel they're very refined but that that surface treatment has a ruggedness. Uh, what is it? Does uh, and I just want to say that um, the original Mad Max and Road Warrior are one of my some of my all time favorite movies. So I'll just throw that out there. Um, so it's funny you should ask. I'm surprised nobody's ever asked that before. That is a so for any of the knife makers out there. Um, I didn't invent it. I found it on the internet. So to get the texture like what you show, I need to stop putting the slack back in the box. Um, so what you do is you take gun blue and mix it with mustard, regular old yellow mustard, mix it into a paste. Um, now this, it doesn't really work on 5160, um, but 1095, 1084 for sure. Uh, it really, it really sets up good. I never could get it to take on 5160, but that's usually a pretty, uh, corrosion resistant metal so i wasted a lot of time trying to force that patina but anywho you mix the gun blue and the mustard into a paste you smear it on the knife after you've cleaned it with acetone soak it in bleach overnight you pull it out that's what you got clean it off with a wire brush you're good to go and that, i love it that that's i love it yeah it's it's super simple um it you'll never get the same result twice and it, it, in terms of style, I wanted something that said, carry me, please, you know, use me. Don't, don't just take me out and put me on a bearskin rug and take a picture of me and put me back up. I mean, my drawing, which I don't have, it's over in the kitchen, but Bobby, this thing is beat up from the feet up. It's all, no, I don't, it is my personal combative display, so it doesn't get used on anything, mm -hmm. but, uh, I'm a utility worker, so it's been – I've been in water leak holes with it. I've been climbing poles with it. I've been mowing with it. I've been jumping in the pool with it. It doesn't matter. Um, get it out, dry it off, you know, oil it if you need to. Um, but I definitely wanted them to look rugged and kind of the, the, the juxtaposition between, like, an acrylic scale um, and a texture. So this Tonto actually sold to one of my buddies in, in – uh, California, um, but you you know you've got your acrylic handle and the textured blade, which mm. I left the gold. The gold is just temper colors left on the on the metal. So when after I quench these, if I take it and I clean it off with a wire brush or like a uh, scotch brite wheel, get the metal clean and then you put it into the oven to temper, and you're left with that uh, straw bronze color which i just think is is really pretty um so i leave it on some blades just i don't know oh but what i was going to say was i i like the, the it, what i what i thought of in my mind when i started doing the texture and the, the acrylic candles was i want this to look like something that you pull from a grotto you know some kind of loot that you found that some kind of magical quality i don't know you well, know you like, get me into it's like finding the sword in the tomb and exactly exactly all the, all the old corrosion and like yeah this is my sword. exactly yeah that, that's that's the the vibe that i wanted 
people to get. And I, you know, and I'll say this uh, as as another uh, interesting fact. This is actually the first time that I've shown my face ever uh, as Rip Splitter Knife Works. There's no pictures of me on the site. Uh, you know, people that know me can find me, obviously. Um, but I, I I thought it would be cool to not that anybody cares because that was the whole thing. That's the whole reason why I never showed myself my face um, on the camera was I never wanted it to be about me. I wanted it to be about the knives, you know, um, good, bad, or indifferent. Sometimes knife pages turn into knife and my opinions on X, Y, Z or knives and political blah, 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 blah. It's like, yeah, that's not what I wanted. You know, nobody that's cares the- about my opinion. So well, that's, that's why uh, I'm convinced, you know, I, I have my own, very strong opinions as, as we all do. Uh, but I'm also aware that people come here so they don't have to hear about that. You know, right. um, chan- right. chances are if they're coming to this channel, we're in, in a similar universe anyway, and it yeah. doesn't matter. And, and, and even if we aren't, it still doesn't matter. Cause we're here to talk about knives and yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. that. Uh, like, yeah. like it just, just like uh, just because you're a good actor doesn't mean what you have to say. Uh, when the camera's not rolling uh, about politics means anything. Same thing with knife makers. <laughs> right. Across the board. Across the board. Yeah, I, I, I want people to come to the page and just uh, be stoked and see some really cool stuff. That I mean, it's all organic. I never know what I wish, Bobby. I wish people would just all get on there and be like, man, sure wish you'd make some tontos or man sure want to see the drugs come back but no you know it's 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 fishing it's fishing is what it is i throw the lure out there and i hope somebody's on the other side uh that wants to receive the product that i you know can offer so let me let me, let me ask you this uh mm-hmm. um when it comes to uh first of all i'm loving the bigger knives i love the exotic shapes the chris as i mentioned before we'll talk about the chris uh i definitely want to talk about the chris uh, for but, sure. Um, the fact that you are making weapons, um, and beautiful ones, like look at the handles. Right? We still need. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd like to hear about your philosophy on on ergonomics and handles because they're so beautiful. Uh, but but what I'm what I'm getting at here is, um, you make weapons largely, um, mm-hmm. even though I happen to find that Pical knives are great just all around utility carry knives, but make a good box uh, opener, but generally you, you make weapons. Um, how do, but, but you're, a, you're not like a, you don't, a, a, a pr, you, you don't present as a, as a violent psychopath. You make, yeah. uh, you make tools for good people to protect themselves and their loved ones is probably that's the hope. Okay. So, so the, the fact that you make weapons, where does that come from? And not just like EDCs or Skinners or whatever. Oh, for sure. Um, you know, growing up uh, in the country, you know, you've got, everybody's always got an eye on them um, for doing menial tasks around the house or the farm or whatever. Um, everybody's always got guns, you know, for obvious reasons. So, and then, you know, growing up as a boy, playing a lot of video games, watching a lot of movies, reading a lot of, reading a lot of books uh comics you know it just weapons always fascinated me and i always thought they were really cool i remember i had a uh, oh i don't know it was like two and a half inches thick but it was like an encyclopedia on all of the uh firearms that were made from and this was like an old book well old it was like early 2000s to you know whatever mid 1800s or whatever and i just I'm through and I'd look at him and be like, oh, that one's cool. That one's not. Um, I remember going to gun shows and there was a creepy dude with long hair who was always in the corner of the gun show. And he was the dude that was selling the dragon statues and the wizard t shirts and the claymores and all that cheap pot metal stuff that your parents said that's crap. You don't need that, you know, but you buy anyways. So I had every conceivable Knights Templar. Braveheart, Claymore, Dragon Statue, Wizard shooting fireballs from the back of the Dragon T-shirt. I mean, I had it all, man. I was hooked up with that stuff. Um, so when when you grow up in the country and 
uh, there, we didn't have neighbors. So if there wasn't anything to do or for you to do, you just kind of sat and imagined stuff. So, you know, I'm always drawing knives and drawing swords, and drawing shields. And um, I remember I drew my school as a castle one time and like people invading and attacking the castle and stuff. And dad was like, I, uh, you probably shouldn't be drawing stuff like that. Like, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, but I don't know. That's just that's always where my mind's been. Um, I've always been fascinated with them. Um, I have a very, very healthy respect for all weapons be them knife sword axe gun whatever cannon um you definitely have to come from a, a place of respect um when dealing with anything i'm fortunate to say i haven't really cut myself i've cut myself probably two or three times um you know kickbacks or a belt will break or something like that but uh i always try to keep that in mind that you know you're dealing with dangerous stuff yeah. Um, so I'm very thankful to say that I've made a lot of knives and I've only cut myself a couple times. So, uh, the, the, the weapons, um, the whole to topic of weapons as you're talking, um, you know, I think about this a lot, uh, but it just occurred to me. It's also just a, uh, uh, a leveling, uh, a playing field level a leveler. You know, you feel like okay, mm -hmm. with this on me, I feel a little bit more confident in this neighborhood, uh, mm -hmm. or whatever. It's like, absolutely you know, giving, giving the, giving the, the cat his claws. Um, speaking of which, okay, bring out that Chris, please. Uh, you're, you're, oh, I want to talk about the, the evolution of your shapes. Yeah. Um, so, you know, pick early on and then, and then, and then started, started to see some clip points and some other, uh, knives, but the Chris, oh, look at this thing. That is. So the, don't hate me, Bobby. Don't hate me, but the Chris was really pushed by my dad because he's a big, he's the Chris dude. You want the Chris, you go to dad. Um, but he's like, oh, you got to make some Chris. You got to make some Chris. I was like, oh, you know, okay. And uh, anywho, I, I mean, I mean, I, I'm a fan now. I am a fan. They always just looked hard to make, to be honest with you. And to, and to be perfectly honest, they are hard to make. Um, they're a lot harder to make um compared to like your regular edc knives so here here i'll let you in on the, the super secret so each of the divots fits up perfectly with one of uh, the wheels on my 2x72 grinder <laughs> um the the only hard part um in terms of making crisp for me is actually grinding the bevels and it's the same thing with uh, making a pakal style knife if I were to take a two inch belt and try and grind these bevels, I would dig constantly, you know, because the belts don't flex. Um, even the flexy ones at two inches wide, they're not going to flex enough to give a smooth profile. So, um, so I ended up uh, cutting a lot of my two by 72 belts in half. And let me tell you something, you want to make a dangerous uh, tool in the garage. Get your razor knife out and try and cut some belts in half and see if I don't snag something. So um, I'm actually a big fan of one by 72 belts. Um, it's the same thing like for the dog here. If I took a two inch belt and tried to grind that, yeah. it, it's not going to work. So um, with the crisp, I use, and especially with the calls, um, one by 72 belt. But also, I will work this off um, the side of the belt. That way, I don't have a, uh, as much surface area of the belt hitting the blade at any one time. So uh, I can get smoother bevels. So, but no, I, I, am a, I am now a fan of the Chris. There was a run. I think I did 10 or 12 of them. Um, kind of like EDC size. I think the blades were around four yeah, inches or so, and I did the texture. With the little blue handles, I, I saw those on your yeah. on your feet. Um, that, you put that away too soon. I want to talk about it, but I also want to talk about the yeah. handle. Uh, of course, uh, the handle of the crisp. But just talk about handles in general. Um, uh, they all look uh, really comfortable, and you know we can all look at something like a knife handle and tell whether it's going to be ergonomic. Uh, this this mm -hmm. uh, drog handle is very comfortable, but. Uh, Beautiful materials and a real smoothness that that's a nice contrast 
uh, in surface texture to the blade. Yeah, you know, it's the same thing. Carrying a knife is the same thing as carrying a gun, in my opinion, is that if it's not comfortable, uh, you're not going to carry it. So the blade handle has to be ergonomic and comfortable to 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 wield. Um, if this thing is rough or I have a personal vendetta against blocky handles, and some people like blocky handles, so that's fine. That's fine. I don't mind. But me personally, what I like to uh, to see, like I'll just take the draw, for example. The um, pommel hook is actually a little bit swelled from the rest of the blade because um, I want a good thumb purchase on the pommel hook. Um, I don't want my hand to be crowded. I don't want any wiggle room in the, in the handle. Um, I am a big fan of the pinky groove. Let me see if I've got anything down here with the pinky groove. I mean, I, I don't have anything right here. Um, but, you know, you You're get talking, on the, the Instagram, you can see it. Like right here. Groove right here, right? Yep. I'm a big fan of getting that pinky down away from the cutting edge. Um, so, like, this this is one of my fighters. Really crazy name, right? Um, <laughs> so, here we are. Um, my hand fits perfectly for me in there. Um, there's no sliding. It's... It's it's all just to keep your hand from sliding over the bra the blade. That's one of the main reasons why um, I love the reverse edge knife um, in the scythe grip is that thumb cap is so strong. And then especially if you give yourself um, like, like this eagle's head uh, pommel hook, okay. that really lets you just crush it right there between your thumb and your pointer finger and just... It, it's just the best feeling grip for me. Uh, and the same thing, even on, even on the Chris, I think the pommel hooks look cool. I think um, a decent belly isn't required. Oh, I, I wasn't on the camera. Um, a decent belly, like I say, it's not required. I make a lot of blades that don't have a big belly. Um, You're about actually, the well, of the handle, right? The palm. Correct. Swell. Yeah. Yeah. The belly here. I guess if I flipped it upside down, it would look more like a belly. Um, but I personally like. A belly to my knives um but of course here again you've got the pommel hook you've got an indentation for your uh your pointer finger and that's just the most secure method i've found for making handles i want to show you this other what you might call it are these, all acrylic? Are these all acrylic handles so you know you've got the black g10 there um i've got some i've got a lot of i don't know i go in I go in cycles. My favorite, if, if somebody were to say, Matt, what's your favorite handle to make? I just, and so I come from like a custom car, custom motorcycle background. So think like big, big daddy Ed Roth, right? You know, gassers, 55 straight axles and stuff like that. So I really just love the crazy colors, the pop. Um, so my favorite personally is probably the acrylics just because how pretty they are. Are they the most practical? Are they the grippiest in the world? But man, they sure are pretty, and I love looking at them. Um, and, and if the ergonomics, if the ergonomics are there and your grip is tight, it, it you're good to go. Hey, have you seen this stuff, Fordite? Yes. Um, so I order my belts through True Grit, and they're actually having a big Fordite sale. Have you had any experience with it? I, I have uh, never used it, uh, or I, I have no. I don't have any knives with Fordite on. And if if anyone's curious, mm -hmm. uh, Fordite is a material that's basically harvested from the uh, rooms that they that they spray paint cars in factories. Uh, and you know, all of that paint drains into you know some sort of receptacle, and it it doesn't mix. It just sort of swirls around, and it dries into this hard, um, you know, material plastic basically mm -hmm. and uh people they sell it as fordite which is funny i guess ford motor yeah. company must must have been the first um and it looks cool it's it's and there's mm -hmm. no two uh slabs the same um it's so, so true um 
No, I, I want to get my hand on it. I actually won some true stone scales from uh maker material supply i think on instagram i was just scrolling through and they're like hey first person to say whatever gets it and so i said Bleh. and they said okay you win it and so the true stone stuff which is like reconstituted uh stone i'm sure it's some sort of uh epoxy or enamel or a, you know two-part epoxy that they mix together with a stone anywho turns out really cool brittle very brittle um so you got to be careful when you're drilling it but i just love any handle that pops for sure um and in terms of grip i have so if somebody scrolls way back don't go too far back because you'll see some really ugly knives but if you go back a good ways um i've got more than enough um testing videos where i had this old rolled up corrugated cardboard thing with like three um moving blankets wrapped around it and i would stab it and you know just just show that you know that they would penetrate um i cover my hands in oil cover my hands in water i've never had any problem gripping now i'm not nobody's attacking me and or trying to disarm me or anything like that but i've never had a grip problem from acrylics from wood from g10 you know what i mean um yeah. if somebody is coming for my knife i guarantee you you will not get it out of my hand and then it will not slip I promise you that it could be made out of whatever. It does not matter. Um, but I'm a big fan of the acrylics. I love the wood too. Wood takes a little bit longer for me to work down. And then of course you've got the G10s, um, which are awesome as well. I got one here, uh, one of the Skinners. This is G10. This is a uh, Dymalux, which is like a laminated wood mm. in red and black. And it polishes up just like acrylic really like that stuff oh that's um, a, I, I know that mo show show us all your models since you're pulling them out i know okay. that one's kind of like yeah. a, a clip point scanner so, i think yep just a clip point scanner this is that's cool um it's basic but it works right um clip point scanner that's exactly wait, wait, it. hold it up hold it up so we can see oh it. yeah okay yeah, thank you thank you i've seen it a thousand times so i'm like no, I i've seen it <laughs> so beautiful pop. it's got it's got a, a pretty decent polish. I could have gone a little bit better, um, but it's a skinner and it has a little bit of uh, texture to it, just a little bit, which I don't know if you can catch it on the blade or not, but there is a little yep. bit of texture, which I thought was just cool. There's just enough, it just, just enough to make an accent. Um, we've got the drug here in maple, which is the one I've been showing, uh, working on. Hold on, let me, let me just do this to my camera. Bloop, bloop. Maybe. Yeah, it's a little cleaner. I should have done that when we started. Um, but the drug with copper pins, the spine has been polished. Nice wedge um, so, on that one. Yeah, I um, like I say, Bob. Uh, nobody tells me what to make. Um, I wish sometimes that people would just tell me what they want. But so I just make whatever. I make what what pops into my head, you know, like, like this machete here that I made. Um, That's cool. I was like, I want to make a chopper. It's three sixteenths thick. I really like um, what the ATNs, the guys are doing the Kali guys. Mm -hmm. They make something kind of looks like this. Um, this is way cooler. I'm sure. So go buy there. It's not mine, um, but it's got cookable handles, 16th inch pins, which I thought were really cool. They were a big pain in the butt to do. Um, oh my oh, god, you, you want to see the, a mess? The the four on the pommel and up front. Yeah, yeah. yep. Yeah. I got four sixteenth inch ones. And I got an eighth one in the middle. But if you want to see a mess, come out and watch me glue handles. It is. <laughs> I can't stand gluing handles. Well, you do. Um, you do like a. You do like a Sunday drop, right? Uh, is that yeah. something you're still doing? Yeah, and and I love those videos mm -hmm. where you show everything off and and you 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 hold each one in your hand and mm -hmm. um those videos are are really good they're they're a little zen you know you can just kind of zone out and watch them uh but because i mute all the dog barking and kids crying <laughs> but it's great to see the uh just how something fits in hand you know <clears throat> yeah, well and that's exactly why i did it um i wanted people to you know pictures pictures uh do so much but a video just going over what does it look like in the shade what does it look like in the light how does it fit in your hand does it fit is it ergonomic in uh both grip styles you know stuff like that and 
I would have to say I can't think of any knife that I've made off the top of my head that isn't um, equally comfortable in like hammer or scythe grip. So like take your take the fighter for example, your hammer grip, you're good to go. Your reverse edge, your scythe grip, you're good to go. Um, you're not going to hold every knife in in scythe grip, obviously, and you're not going to hold every knife in hammer grip. Um, but I wanted the, the the option to be there. Oh man, what else have we got? So this is just a different. This is I think it's called Lava Flow Acrylic Scales. Ooh. It's a really dark blue with some nice. like a matte red. And I'm sorry, guys, my camera's my camera's junk. You got a cooler camera. You look way better than I do. Um, but just kind of a different variation on the fighter. Um, not really any big difference, per se, but in terms of blade shape. Well, um, I know uh, I know a lot of a lot of people, myself included, are daily carriers of knives of about this size. Show show us the sheaths and 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 how. Oh yeah, uh, for sure. How you have Let me grab another one here. For daily carry. So, Here's a Tonto uh, in the Dynalux. The way I personally carry is horizontally, um, like noon 30 across the belt with a belt loop, with an IWB belt or make your own leather strap. Um, I offered I offered belt loops for a while, and people were like, meh, take her to leave it. I offered clips for a while, and people were like, meh, take her to leave it. So I do, I, this is how they come, just like this. Um, these sheaths obviously quarter inch rivets, so they accept any type of uh clip, strap, whatever molly stuff. Um, you can attach it, you know, you can attach it any way you want, carry it any way you want. Um, I've carried blades like these static line, you know, through the through the bottom yeah. with a piece of paracord in the pocket that works great. Um, you get you uh, like a dis uh, discrete carry concepts clip and run it up to just about below the pommel slip that in waistband ah yeah, that's, see that's what i have yep i mean this is a, that's awesome cherry like uh clip and yep right in the mm -hmm. waistband um i carry horizontally across my belt line because it's most comfortable for me i'm always moving all over the place so it has to stay out of the way mm -hmm. um it has to ride comfortably conceal it, it conceals really good. Um, concealment isn't a big problem for me because I don't really go anywhere that uh, you're not allowed to. Kansas is really cool because you can carry anything you want, basically, in terms of blades. So it's really good. Um, so I don't have to worry about concealed or not, but it never shows. I've never had anybody say anything. Um, and the garment clear to draw is really fast. Um, I do want to mention, oh, right. occasionally when you sell axes, you know, Let's see, um, they take a little bit more time. So this is like a little baby hawk, um, eighth inch metal, which nobody really makes. And that's purple heartwood, I believe. Nice. Nobody uh, makes these hawks in eighth inch, uh, but I do because I'm weird. Really like really fast. Uh, you're not going to be knocking down any uh, hedge trees with it. Right, right. But this if you're talking a, to this is not a breaching tool. This is a fighting tool. Correct. Yeah, and I make yeah. I, I make quarter inch ones too. I mean, if you want to go hack your neighbor's door down there, you go get the quarter inch one. But if you're just talking organic medium, um, this is the ticket. That's not the, not that's recommended, the ticket. by the way. Not recommended. No, I would never recommend that. Don't um, do that. Uh, the bird's beak on that tomahawk is pretty cool because it's very uh, it's very mm -hmm. much like uh, a large knife. That is cool. Yeah, and that's um, definitely this one is decent. I would even if I were to go back and do this uh, again, I would even maybe accentuate it a little bit more because um, the only the only grip concern you're going to have with like a with a an axe or a hatchet is just slipping off the end of it. So you definitely you want to talk about palm hooks. Oh, you want to talk about mothers? Anybody, nobody probably watches like girl anymore. Uh, there's a palm hook for you. So this is the Shaska looking Kasak short sword, and I was like. How egregious can I make a bobble hook? And so that is what that is. That is very much in keeping with, uh, um, uh, well, if it looks like the pommel of a Filipino sword. Uh, that yeah, exactly. Cool. Just like what some I, of the stuff you've got hanging on your wall behind you. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of that kind of uh, 
hook because it's exactly you know, what I was going for. Swinging that thing around, it's gonna it's gonna stay caught in the hand. And, it really will. Um, it's it's a good grip. I do have a little bit of a swell here at the. Where's my camera? There we go. Um, a little bit of a swell there just to prevent slippage off of that way. Um, but man, with a swell like that, I mean, I was out hooking a lot of stuff with this before I put it up for sale, and I was like, I'm gonna chop you, and I'm gonna chop you, and I'm gonna chop you. Uh, well, okay, let, let me. You you sort of alluded to this before, but let me ask you. Um, uh, about the business uh, aspect mm -hmm. of knife making, and um, I know it's not an easy road to hoe. I've I've heard that from a lot of people, um, but from your perspective, um, tell me about the business of having a small knife company. Um, so, like I say, I couldn't express my gratitude enough um, to everybody that has bought a product from rib splitter knife works uh i mean people are quite literally the lifeblood of the company i've sold maybe five or six knives to two people around here um the rest has been 100 percent internet based so that's been i never would have guessed that in a thousand years um but i started out um with the idea that i wanted to make handmade tools for the working class right so what that means to me is there are there's a hundred different knife makers out there making five hundred dollar knives and you know what they're kick ass and they are meticulous and they're pristine and they're beautiful and i would never want it to leave my house because it was five hundred dollars and there's nothing wrong with that um it's you know, that's the beauty of capitalism, right? You can, it's worth whatever somebody's willing to pay for. Um, but I wanted to make a fixed blade that somebody working a nine to five can afford and use and train with and get proficient with uh, without busting the bank because I could never afford one of those. I always wanted like a tracker dam, a, gu a guadagna, right? <laughs> I was like, oh, that's it. That's the, the magnum opus. Um, and they're like twelve hundred dollars. Yeah, he makes those things with files, you know. Yeah, like there's, <laughs> and, and you know what? And that's awesome. Yeah, um, there's no way, you know. It's so hard I can pump you out a file knife. I've, I've done file knives before, but it ain't gonna be no twelve hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, yeah. is the value there? I don't know. I've never handled one. It doesn't matter. It's not my knife. Um, yeah. they're beautiful knives, and he seems like a really awesome guy. Him and his wife, and they seem to do really well for themselves. So. I'm thumbs up. I'm two thumbs up for people being able to sell their product for more than I sell my products for. I think that's awesome. And I'm glad to see it. Um, so that, that's who I curtail my product to. Um, these knives all have a personality. They are not perfect. There are things that I could be like, well, really, and truly that I could make that better or I could do that better. Um, but I try my darndest and I hope that um people realize in, in terms of the business i will never make if i were to charge ten dollars an hour for me working on a knife i would never i would never be able to make any money i don't make any money off my time i make zero money off my time um and, and i do that purposefully so that hopefully people realize and um lean into the fact that i'm making it for people like me that, that they can't afford um a two three four hundred dollar knife but they still want something to protect themselves or use at their job um they want a they want a quality fixed blade um with a lifetime warranty i mean i'll fix anything i probably only had two or three people come um like blow out a handle or something one dude ran it it fell off his four wheeler and he ran it over and you know uh tore up the wood or something I was like this no worries dude i can i can work it down and see if i can salvage it if not we'll put a new handle on it. it's it's 11 dollars of wood it's fine don't worry about it the, the the one thing you're missing if 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 i may interrupt is that sure. all those things you mentioned you could get at walmart from a knife the thing you can't get is the mm -hmm. pride of ownership of having a handmade knife and having something that's uh 100 unique um i mm -hmm. have a pretty big an embarrassingly large collection of knives and only in the last like since i've been doing this interview show the last five years have i started getting 
custom handmade knives from people and they mean so much more to me uh than than most of my other uh production knives uh, just that's because, awesome to hear well and i've also i've had a chance to talk with people like i'm talking with you like when was the last time uh, you had an uninterrupted hour-long conversation with so it doesn't happen that often unfortunately that's true that is absolutely true and then and then it's impossible it's like nearly impossible not to fall in love with that person's knives and be like ah, I, now i really like and that's not that's not every time but the point is um you know you you could be making a knife that a guy's going to be using or a, or a woman is going to be using for the next 50 years and they give to their kids uh and and it it's going to be the them totally unique and totally mm -hmm. capable and uh, you know character all the character built into that you can't get from gerber that's the rub bobby that's the rub right there it's um it, like i said no two knives are unique um i have fiddled with each of these knives and put them in my hands and rolled them around and said uh, does this fit I've, I've ran my thumb along each of these edges a thousand times as i'm sharpening them going you know are there any spots that i'm missing um they are truly handmade from i mean I, I don't know any i don't know how i can make them any more handmade and some of them are glaringly obvious they're handmade you know if you hear what i'm saying you know um but there's a lot of love that goes into it and um i hope that people see that reflected in their product and realize that um that each of these blades means something to me when I was working on each of them. Uh, they, they all have a special spot in my heart. Um, it still stokes me up when people send me pictures of uh, knives they bought two, three years ago. And I'm like, Oh my God. Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. you know, but, but I'm so excited because people are still carrying them. And um, just, just another ode to the gratitude. I never thought I could do this. I'm the most uncreative person you'll meet Bobby. Huh. Um, but I think you, I think God's given me this gift um, to use, and so it it would be it would be a waste of the fire within me to squander it and not keep going. I I'll, I will keep yeah. doing this even when there's no money in it. I was doing it when there was no money in it. Um, if people stopped buying my knives today and I never sold another one, I would have a massive hoard of knives in my closet, which I already kind of have a pretty big you know collection. Um, I can't not do it anymore. I can't not make knives anymore. So I well, guess I you got just, the bug. You just said I'm I'm the least creative guy, and then you turned around and said I can't stop making knives. It it uh, something's not. Well, I didn't say they were good. I didn't I didn't say they were beautiful or anything like that. But, but, I just said I'm not uh, obviously Picasso. You're, obviously you're creative. But the the other thing is that uh, a sign. I think uh, what I've found in my life is that a sign of an artist is someone you know who looks at their at their work you know past work no matter how old or how new and they're like uh, I, I always oh. meant to you know make that blue or take the edge off of this or or whatever it is you're always critical of your work and whatever you're working on at the moment is the latest and greatest and whatever you've just finished mm -hmm. is embarrassing or or yeah yeah that was good when, but exactly when you made your youtube video and included my drawing in it i was like oh my god no <laughs> Somebody oh, yeah. made it. Oh, and I was like, oh, no, 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 no. And I looked and I was like, oh, no. Uh, there's another guy. Uh, oh, God. Dave, this old sword. Old broken sword. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm not good with names. Um, he actually got a drug too uh, with gold handles. And now, and both of your guys' blades are fine and they're beautiful and they work. And I, I sure hope you guys both like them. Um, but I, to see my own product on, on the YouTube screen, I was like, oh God, oh, I hope he doesn't, you know, it's just, <laughs> you know, when you look at it through the, through the maker's eyes, I'm just like, oh God, I hope they like it. You know, oh, yeah, it, yeah. it freaks me out. It, it legitimately, um, every, every time I send out a knife, I'm like, oh, I hope they like it. You know, and I've, I've never, um, I'm very thankful and fortunate that, that I have not ever had anybody come back and be like, oh, your knife sucks or it's ugly or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, I've received critiques. I love critiques. I, I fully encourage anybody that buys a knife from me that sees something that I can fix or something they don't totally agree with or would like changed. Please tell me, because how will I know if nobody tells me Good and if everybody blows a bunch of smoke up my butt, I don't know what yeah. to do differently. Yeah. And I definitely don't want to go down 
and have made 200 drugs. And then somebody like, well, you know what? If you'd make that palm hook, a uh, quarter inch shorter shoe would be a lot better. Then everybody's like, yeah, yeah, I kind of like that too. Yeah, a little short of hollow look or something, you know? I mean, yeah. Well, gee, thanks. I appreciate that, guys. I, you know, so yeah. I'm all for the, I'm all for the um, positive criticism or whatever they call that. Constructive criticism. Yeah. Constructive criticism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talking smack <laughs> nicely. So uh, talking smack nicely. So as we wrap here, uh, what where do you want um, rib splitter and knife works? How do you envision it down the road? Like in its full maturity. Hopefully, well, full maturity. I'll tell you one thing I really like, Bobby. Um, I'm still in my little ten by ten shed, and it's ten by ten. It's I can take like a step over and reach everything from one wall to the other. I'd like to get a little bit bigger spot to do this one day. Um, if I can look back in five years and come talk to you and I'm still doing this and the knives are still selling, that's good enough for me. I'm, I, when I started making knives, I had no misconceptions about thinking I was going to make it big. I didn't even think I was going, I, I had no sincere hope that I was even going to sell a knife. Um, so everything, everything that happens is icing on the cake is awesome. I'm thankful for every day I can get up and make knives. Um, and I hope that every day I earn the opportunity to continue to serve people. So I just want to keep doing what I'm doing. I don't want to be um, getting a water jet order for 3,500 blanks and 3,500 pre-cut handles and 3,500 pre-cut sheaths. And I slap them all together and ship them out. And, you know, uh, I just want to keep making these by hand. I want to keep making whatever comes pops into my head or, or that people want to see. And if, if I can keep doing this long enough to, to pass this down to my kid and teach him a trade uh, or something, you know, you can do, um, cause this isn't obviously my first, uh, this is not my full-time job. Um, but just the ability to, to make knives that people want, that's enough for me. I'm not hard to please. <laughs> well, all right. We're not hard to please either. Just uh, keep making cool knives and we'll buy them. I'll try. Uh, <laughs> Matt, thank you so much. Matt uh, Carlson of Rib Splitter Knife Works. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. It was great to finally meet you. We tried to do this a couple of times and I'm glad it finally worked, man. It was really nice meeting you. My pleasure, Bobby. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. All right. Take care. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion, featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super-sharp crenulated bezel, and built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch, thenifejunkie.com slash shockwave. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Matt Carlson of Rib Splitter Knife Works. Go check him out. Uh, uh, Rib Splitter Knife Works uh, underscore Knife Works on Instagram or uh, the website. There is uh, he always seems to have, like we mentioned before, a Sunday drop. And uh, frequently there's a video leading up to it where you can see what what the new knives are. Uh, really, really awesome. Go check them out. Uh, and be sure to check out Thursday Night Knives on Thursday, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. And, of course, the Midweek Supplemental on Wednesdays. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.